to Mind Science TV. I'm Richard Hill, as I hope you're well aware of by now. And this week, I'm actually interviewing someone in Australia, which is uh, fantastic. My good friend, Philip Armstrong. So, first of all, just say, hello, Philip. Good to have you. Good afternoon. It's great to be here in your studio. That's terrific. Now, uh, you, you have to, unfortunately, like everybody else, you have to now be very humble while I tell everybody how amazing you are. <laughs> Go for it. See, that's the difference between Australians. So, uh, Philip Armstrong is probably uh, most known because uh, he is the CEO of ACA, the Australian Counselors Association, which is uh, the peak body for counselors and psychotherapy in Australia, of whom I am a member and very proud to be so. Uh, but Philip is much more than just a CEO. Although he's in the business area now, he's also been involved uh, in psychotherapy and counseling for many years. We'll talk about that. He's also doing the stuff which I really am keen about, mind science things that he was really keen about, which is the international marketplace. And these are the things that we're going to let him talk about because he's the man who's right in the middle of it. But although it's uh, there's fascinating stuff with the politics and the business, I want to kind of press uh, Philip to start off with to reflect about his experiences as uh, as in the, in the military service, which he was in, and what he did after that. So, Philip, that's where I would like it if you could start. Some reflections on this history you have as a as a practitioner that that sure it certainly mm. led you to become a uh, an administrator. Yeah, I suppose, well, yeah, it, it certainly was my my military background. I um, I was probably um, part of a, an older generation that left school when they were fifteen, and uh, and uh, well, I left home and in, in, in school and uh, and and work um, rather successfully actually um, in the optical trade, but. Uh, my uh, my family's background and, and our family history is within the military, and I, I felt a, a, a calling to, to join us. So I young, joined the army at a very young age, and uh, ended up doing uh, 15 years in the army. But um, whilst I was in the army, a lot of the um, the work that we did, I was in the um, I was in the uh, the infantry corps, so being what I call an arms corps, and up the sort of up the, the pointy end, and also spent quite a few years in a, in a specialist unit, um, working spe within a specialised area within the service. And one of the, the things that was was necessary to be a, a leader within within the military was understanding human beings. <clears throat> and um, I learned very quickly. Um, my days in the army were very very different to the to the young modern soldier. In uh, you know, uh, bastardisation was part of the system. I mean, it's now illegal, but it was part of part of the system then. Um, most of my instructors uh, were were Vietnam veterans. I mean, Vietnam was still very raw, very new. Um, and um, a lot of the uh, the people we were working under, as I was he called it, was a I was a private in in the infantry, and so um, a lot of those people um, they had um, anger issues. Um, there was a lot of PTSD within the, in the service in those days, and they took it out on 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 the young soldiers. And we had um, all the all the ways of being um, worked in the system. As again, with, with you know all these things, are, they don't encourage it in the system anymore. But you had to very quickly learn to read people to survive, um, and to minimise the um, the minimise the amount of bastardisation and, uh, and this sort of thing within the system. Um, and so that was my my first experience of learning the necessities of actually understanding and reading people uh, for self preservation. Mm -hmm. um, not I mean to make it sound terrible. I mean I thoroughly enjoyed it. I loved it actually. It was a, it was a very manly. Thing to do was very macho and and, and those sorts of things. So you know, and, and I, I took that uh, very well. So I learned to, but I learned to, to read people very very quickly, and um, and and I did uh, some time in Southeast Asia, and 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 that was that was really interesting because it was the the culture shock of moving into a new society with a new culture, uh, and we had to work with them. Uh, um, simply our survival was was you know was dependent on them. Um, we were in their country, in, in their world, in their culture, and then it was the challenge of learning to read people who didn't operate the same as we did. Right. <clears throat> that was very, very challenging um, because you you need to, and, and being Australian didn't mean anything. I mean, it didn't carry much weight. Um, as I said, it was, was about working with them in, in, in their culture and their system. And, and further on in my, my career, as, as I as I got promoted and went through the ranks, it became more and more important to be able to work with people at different levels. Um, particularly uh, when I was a, uh, as a senior NCA, working with um, senior officers. Um, you know, I was working with battalion commanders um, and, um, and and people up there in brigadiers, um, 
So again, it was about learning to work with people because of the command structure. It's not like television, you know, and you don't just stand there and, and you know, people scream in your face. Australian soldiers don't take very readily to people screaming in your face like you see on the television. Um, you know, they are quite likely to turn around and tell you what to do with yourself. But uh, when you're working with officers, there is a command structure and you, you do have to generally jump and, and do what they tell you, regardless of what you think. You learn very quickly how to use that situation and how to sort of manipulate the command structure so that you can actually have your say um, without people belligerently standing there saying, I'm in charge, you must do this. Um, and I think that's the Australian way, which is really good about it. It's about, now hold it, I don't necessarily agree, but it's, you've got to learn how to do that. Showing a bit of humility, making sure you showed respect. So at, within, within the military system itself, you, you learn very, very, well, if you, if you want to get somewhere, you learn very quickly how to work with human beings, particularly in stress situations. And just sort of listening to that here, I, I'm, I'm thinking you've also got to learn to know a bit about yourself. Oh, definitely. Uh, so it's, yes. it's, it's a great teller. So not only looking at others, but, you know, the mirror back on yourself. You, you have to know what you're capable of. You know, you need to know where, where you can go and what you can't do with yourself. Um, and, and, and one thing I'll, I'll say about the military, in my experience anyway, was it is very good for learning about yourself because one thing you do learn is you can't be good at everything. Um, and, um, even if you're good at pushing yourself, you can find there's limitations in, in what environment can you push yourself. You can really push yourself and do well in one environment, but in another you're not so good. And that's okay. It's about learning your failings. That way you don't do the wrong thing by your soldiers by trying to do something you're not capable of doing in the wrong environment. Um, so you do learn a lot about yourself. Because this is about survival. I mean, mm. cause this, this is the thing I think we've got to pay attention to. When we're talking to someone in the services like Philip, we're not just talking about you know, whether he's having a good day or not. This is about actual creating a situation that maintains your capacity to make mm. it to the end of the day. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean your, your job, um, particularly as a leader within the service, is that uh, you want to get to the end of the day with a bloke on your command in one piece. That must be difficult. That, that's, I can't imagine the feeling. I mean, I, well, I can guess, I guess I can imagine. But when we talk about PTSD and a lot of uh, military, mm. this must be just a, a level of stress or a level of disturbance. That yeah, that's, um, and I suppose that, that was what, it was, was uh, an incident that happened um, when um, in um, 93 I was in, uh, in Malaysia and there was a field accident and quite a few people were killed. And that, that hit home because um, it wasn't, it wasn't you know, the, the whole incident wasn't pretty, there was an investigation and the worst thing was we were overseas when it happened. And so there's a feeling of helplessness there. Um, um, particularly the position I was in, I was actually communicating with people in Australia. It was um, the early hours of the morning in Australia time, and people had to get awake. And then suddenly we had to be careful because of media, um, the media getting involved and finding out what was going on. But then we had to deal with the Malaysian authorities, who were very different to Australian authorities. Then there was answering the questions from the families: um, how do they get told? And unfortunately, the, um, the information was drip fed uh, the uh, um, you know, we lost several blokes, but it wasn't just seven people dead. It was a one's dead, on oh no, two are dead, on oh no, three are dead, on oh no, four are dead, which made it worse. It really hit the impact because every time um, you were on the radio, you were going, you know, oh, you know, I hope this isn't uh, you know, another one down, and, and it was, uh, and this kept going. Um, and then it was suddenly seriously injured, and we had to uh, get people evacuated from from Malaysia back to Australia to get um, uh, to get, seri uh, to get these were the serious ones to get medical treatment. Um, but it wasn't just that, that impact, it was um, when the, the boys all came together after the incident, uh, remember we were still in Malaysia, so we, we had very little social support. Um, um, and um, it really started getting home. A, a lot of the, uh, well, the, actually I think all the blokes who, who were killed were either married with children or engaged. Um, so it really had a significant impact uh, in that way. And um, a lot of them were, were senior junior leaders. Um, so they were very, very well known, and suddenly the um, you know we had to, re to rely on each other mm -hmm. to talk about it, and there was no one trained um, at that time. I'd actually just before we'd gone to Malaysia, I'd completed a, a course at TAFE on welfare, um, and so everybody was saying, "Oh, Philip, what do we do? What do we do?" And I'm going, "Oh, I don't <laughs> leave, know. leave the group." Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it was, was a was a course in welfare, and, and and to this day, I have no idea what what prompted me to do that course in welfare, which is the one thing I've never been able to work out. I just went to my commander one day and said, look, there's a course going down there and because of all the stuff we've happened and we, we'd had blokes come back from Cambodia and there'd been a few problems anyway. 
Um, and I just thought, I'd like to get to know a little bit more about how you work with people in these sort of situations. And, and in those days, it was just a paper. And the Army paid for it, so it was really good. <laughs> so, I, so I did a course in welfare. And so that, that started snowboarding. And when we got back to Australia, um, there was quite a few weeks difference between when the, when, when the, the accident happened. And, and what made it even worse was that um, we had to rely on people sending videos back to us in Malaysia for the funeral mm -hmm. uh, because the bodies were sent home. And so there was very little closure for us in that we couldn't attend the funeral um, or, or talk to the family. We were just seeing it on the news, we were reading the paper, um, and we were seeing videos of the funeral. And, and that really that, it made it very difficult for a lot of blokes to deal with um, because there was, there was no... We, um, as you see now with Afghanistan, the, you, know, you see they, they have the, the, uh, the, the ceremonial parties as they put them on the plane to take the bodies home, the coffins back to Australia and all that. Um, and that really helps with the closing and, and, and dealing with it. Um, back in those days, I mean, there was no protocol because these things weren't supposed to happen. Um, most people in Australia don't even know what happened, actually. Um, it wasn't highly... Um, uh, you know, the media really... Uh, said, well, the media weren't really told, but no, it, it, was, it, it wasn't something that happened a lot in Australia. So um, there was none of that closing. And when we got back to Australia, a lot of blokes had a lot of problems, and a lot of blokes who were involved in the accident started coming down with, with problems. And, and um, by then, I'd actually... Uh, been accepted by the army to do a degree in psychology, food distance education, and so I was doing um, psych. Um, again, I had no reason. I had actually no idea why. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I just was, was doing it. And so, blokes were coming and talking to me, and I really didn't have a clue what I was doing. And, and I, and I had said that at the time, but, um, but um, I did a, a field placement in uh, the army community services where the councillors are, and so I learned a little bit then about how to do it. But what I was going through through the system, um, it was obvious that there were major problems, and I become more and more and more interested as the impact of the accident started impacting on myself. Mm. Um, and, and I started having trouble um, dealing with it. And there were, there were, I, I won't go into the politics, but were, it was more to it than just the accident. A lot of, uh, lot things, of things happened. Yeah, and the way it was, was dealt with. But, but uh, that, that really got me thinking about myself. And, uh, and the weird thing was, was only uh, 12 months after that, I got medically discharged myself. Mm. Um, and that was because um, my, my knees were... I got a, a, Actually, it was one, one, one trauma impacted on by another with me, uh, which really impacted on me as far as my mental health was concerned, was I, um, I was um, looking at getting promoted and doing promotion courses. Uh, um, this accident happened. We came back to Australia. We were all feeling pretty down, and, and there was a lot of questions being asked about ourselves. And then uh, I went into a uh, hospital to have an arthroscopy. This is a 24-hour procedure. Three months later, I came out of hospital. I got a staph infection, nearly lost my leg, and... I, uh, my liver closed down and my, my kidneys closed down because I had a dose me on, on antibiotics to try and save my leg. And, and so what turned in 24-hour procedure was three months later in, in the military hospital going under um, physio and all the rest of it. So I was in the hospital for three months. And this is on top of... Yeah. Of, of, and this is just sort of laying on top, so... Well, right on top of it. And, and at the same time, the investigation for the accident was going on and I was called into the... I had to go on crutches to, for the investigation. And, and so it was was just not being able to deal with one thing or another. So suddenly... Um, you know, my life, I'm in this hospital and, and I'm about to lose my leg and then I don't lose my leg and I save it and I've got all these other compounding and then they say, sorry, you're buggered, you're going to have to discharge. Um, so suddenly I'm out of a job and uh, one minute the military's my life and the next minute is, no, sorry, you've got no job. And back in those days, they, don't, they weren't very good at discharging people like they, they've, they've learned a lot since then, uh, particularly with, with the, the boys going to, to Timor Leste and then, then to um, Iraq and then, then uh, Afghanistan. Um, so... Um, but in those days, it was just, you know, look, you've been discharged, we're going to fly you to wherever See you right. want to go and, and, and buy. And I was married with, with a child, and, uh, you yeah, know, my career was gone, my future was gone, my legs were gone, I was told I'd probably never work, I was told I'd be lucky uh, to walk properly again because uh, the the, uh, the infection and all. So that really impacted on me, but I had this degree that I was doing. Yeah. Um, and so when I got discharged, they, um, they allowed me to continue with my training, but they wouldn't, uh, the conversation package wouldn't let me do the degree in, in psych, which I was. Um, in my first year of, um, but they allowed me to do a, uh, was go to a college and, and do a, a counselling course. So I actually went off and I, and I did the counselling course. And while I was doing the counselling course, part of my field placement, it was to me became, um, obvious that, um, veterans is what I, that was where my heart lay and I was still, I still hadn't detached. Mm. I really hadn't got out. I was, yeah. I was just in civilians. They'd let you but, go. But my mind was still there. Yeah. And I was starting to drink. Um, I was having marital problems. So that drinking and that thing—that was—that was sort of uh, dysfunctional self-medication. You're dealing with it. I, yeah, I didn't know how to. I—I I, I couldn't talk to. Them. Who could you talk to? No one understood. Yeah. Um, 
okay by the well, sounds of well, things yeah. at that, at that and, time. And and uh, even working within the RSL, which itself was very dysfunctional because they had the, the World War Two veterans wouldn't talk to the Vietnam veterans, and the Vietnam veterans didn't talk to the Korean veterans, and the Korean veterans were the lost, you know, the lost children because no one remembered the Korean War. And even that, so you didn't, you didn't, you didn't the RSL was, was, was very little, mm. little help to us at the time. Um, and and that again prompted me when with this training in counselling, even though I was had my own issues which I hadn't identified at the time. Um, was I started doing a lot of work with veterans. Because you ended up working for the RSL. Yeah, I ended up, uh, I actually founded a uh, veterans resource centre in, in Logan. And, um, and and that's in uh, Queensland. In Queensland, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I founded this centre and we, we got all this money from Department of Veterans Affairs and we had all these programs for um, getting blokes off the drink uh, and everything else. And of course, at the same time, um, I'm very good at helping these people but going down the tubes myself. Yeah. Um, and it was, um, it was only that... Um, uh, uh, what I was looking at, at um, psychoanalysis and, and, and those types of modalities, I, I really wasn't taking them with psychoanalysis, to be honest. But I thought the one thing that did interest me was, you know, if I want to be a, a proficient counsellor, unless I've been in the chair myself, how am I going to understand what the client's been through? And I, um, and because I was, was part of DVA, they, they funded me, um, and I found a, uh, an exceptional, an exceptional therapist. Um, and, and I was very lucky because he was in very high demand. And, uh, and I ended up doing 18 months of self analysis. Yeah. And putting myself there, the best thing I ever did because it, it made me aware of my, um, my issues with trauma. Um, and, um, that I wasn't dealing with it properly or appropriately. Um, that I was really good at helping other people with it. But I wasn't that good at helping myself. And so, going through that process, uh, over 18 months, um, it really set me up become a practitioner and gave me that self-awareness of issues I had and learning to detach myself from, from my past life being in the military and move into this new life, which was as a therapist. And, and, and so that, that was the, pretty much the, the, the long and the short of it. No, but it's so interesting. I mean, this sense of sort of like, like not so much, a, I don't know, a calling. It sounds a bit too much. But there was you were drawn towards, I mean, circumstances drew, drew you towards it. Your, your particular talents and skills were you towards it, and uh, but and then circumstances kind of allowed you to do it. But uh, they, they they often say that um, uh, when you go to a psychotherapy conference, uh, it's really good because that's where you can pick up clients because everyone's nuts because <laughs> that's why they do psychotherapy. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Well, I must admit, yeah, I, I, I was far better um, therapist than I was at living. I've got to be careful because I'm one too. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's right. I'm a bit yeah. nuts as well. So yeah, so it took a long time for me to, to realise that hey, you know, actually helping people is not that hard. Um, helping yourself is a damn sight harder. But uh, once you help yourself, you become better at helping other people. But it was really that that interpersonal thing mm. uh, that was so important. And and of course, you know, the work I do with interpersonal neurobiology yeah. that that, that uh, we don't just create our own brain. We we create our brain with other brains, right. uh, and it's that great usefulness. But I. Just thinking here, okay, so we're going, we're in the military, we're organized, uh, but then you're a leader in the, in the military, but then you've got this, this, this huge trauma where you're, you're, you're abandoned in, in many respects. Mm. Just by happenstance, and I'm sure, you know, there are many stories that you've got of, of people who didn't have the good fortune to put themselves into a counseling course, uh, and you work with them a lot. But then you've got to a situation where suddenly you've organized this program, and uh, you're counselling, uh, you're doing work, but you're also uh, organising broader things. So suddenly, I think, I, I, is this where you started to think? Just a minute, I'm a, I, I have an administrative sense of, of things. I have a way of putting things together that that, that work. Yeah, the actually, yeah, to, yes, to to a, to actually to a degree because it, my two things happened. I was working within the, the, the RSL and I, as I said, I found that it was a, a veterans resource centre and, um, and we did a lot of good work getting veterans off the grog and, and, and doing these programs. But then the, um, the, um, the, the state branch of the RSL wanted me to help them to develop their, they, they had a support program going. So I left the centre and I went to work, um, at the state level. And that took me into the war homes where I was actually, um, exposed to the, um, a lot of the, the, the old World War II veterans uh, who had been prisoners of war, and 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 I don't know if you've ever been into a, a, a war home before, um, but it's a terrible place. 
Um, and and this is in the 90s. I mean, I mean they're better now. But I mean, these blokes were being tied down at night and waking up in their own excretion. And you could hear them in the morning yelling and screaming. They want to be cleaned up, and they'll be treated like they were. Or something wrong with them, and and there wasn't. These, these blokes were having nightmares. But I mean, we had one bloke used to walk up and down the the aisle at night time, talking in Japanese, giving himself commands, marching them down. And he worked on the Burma Railway. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the fact that he survived, I mean, you know, was credit to him. Let alone the fact that he was still living. One, but but the way they were treated was was really bad. And so I was trying to be part of the process to try and change some of that, and bring some awareness that these people were still people, um, even though they had issues. Um, and I got disillusioned uh, again. Uh, it, a lot of the politics came into it, and and um, it seemed more about filling beds than it was helping the people in the beds. Um, that was my experience. Um, and so I decided to go into private practice. Um, so even though I was was becoming aware, I had these abilities of developing programs and doing these things. Um, I, I felt um, so disillusioned with with the system at that stage, and just said, "No, I'm going to private practice. I'm going to do it my way." Uh, well, I'm not going to have to answer to anybody and, and work with all these rules and all these restrictions, which, which is funny when you think I came from a military background, but I really had a gut full of working with the system. I, I just didn't like the system. I didn't like its restrictions, and I didn't think it was doing as good a job as it could, and I, didn't feel, I felt money was being misspent, um, and, and I still do. Um, but uh, So I went into private practice, and I developed a very successful private practice, um, and I had a, a lot of clients, and I, I did really, really well in private practice. So I did go from from that into private practice, which was which was great because I, I was my own man. Um, I could be at home uh, when the kids went to school, which most blokes couldn't. Yes. Um, and uh, you know, I was there. When I, I did most of my work at night time, and I worked Saturdays, and and, uh, and I got involved with community projects, and, and that went really really well. Um, but then I uh, got to a point where actually the politics got me again, in that I was again very very frustrated as a lack of recognition of councillors within the system. Um, my practice was going fine and I was doing really well. Um, and I was getting good results. I mean, you know, uh, uh, so and I was getting referrals. I had people coming from all over all over the country, so I'd come down to me for referrals. So I knew my my, my comments as a practitioner was good. Well that's always hard to measure as, as a counsellor we all know. We it all think we're okay good. but but you know it's very hard to measure. But I felt I was doing okay and got a very good reputation, but I was really frustrated with the system. The lack of recognition by government, the lack of recognition of councillors as a whole, the focus on psychology as opposed to counselling, um, uh, the focus on uh, on GPs, mental health, and, and those sort of things. And um, the other the other thing is, I was really angry with my own profession. I was really angry with counsellors and the um, sit back attitude of, oh, we'll just let it all happen, and one day it'll come good. Knowing that life doesn't work that way. Yes, like build it and it will yeah. come. You know, it's and never been true. That's right. Yeah. It worked in the movies when someone yes. paid for it to happen. Yes, it's really good when the script is there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. But we had no representation. There was no one representing us um, to to government to to change any of this. But there didn't seem to be any energy within the industry to do it. Um, people just sat back and and sort of councils were sort of you know, the they were the people you you saw if you couldn't afford a psychologist. Mm. Um, and this is back in the days before even psychology was was available on Medicare. Um, but as a practitioner, I was doing well, and so what I was seeing didn't really fit with my experience as a practitioner. Um, I was held in uh, very good esteem within the local community. Um, I certainly was making money. I was doing well. At the, the, uh, I was doing a job. Um, so my my experience in, in private practice was not consistent with my experience in the industry, and uh, and I just thought, no, there's something got to be done about this. Uh, I'm really, you know, this is really feeding me off. We need to really get involved politically. And at that stage, they, um, there was um, two organisations that were were um, that were starting up. Um, and, I, and I won't get political here, but uh, one one of the organisations I got involved with very very early on, and I became very disillusioned very quickly um, about the way it was. I, it wasn't involved in the way I'd like to see it involved. Yeah. So so but that's just my my. Thing. Um, but then there was a job advertised within this Australian Council Association, and I'd never heard of it. And I thought, well, well, this is this is bizarre. There's an Australian Council Association, and I've never heard of it. And I don't know anybody who, who has heard of it. And it was a job going as the uh, as a, uh, it was the, the membership liaison officer. And so um, I applied for it. Um, and uh, during that time, I'd gone to uni and, and paid. I actually uh, paid up front and put myself through uni. 
You uh, paid for your university? Well I, I did. <laughs> I only paid for it up front because I could claim it back in tax. Because you could get it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. as opposed to getting a hex bed, yeah. I, because I was practicing, I could pay for it up front, and I got it was 25% discount. Paying yeah, up front. no, it's much better. <laughs> then, oh, no. then I claimed it back in tax. So actually, it was, you know, was, was really good. And because I got RPL'd, my, my, my diploma in counselling I had, and then plus the subjects I'd done in my degree in psych, all got RPL. So it was really good. So I, I did my, my degree, um, which was very fortunate because... Um, the uh, well, applying for the job, you needed a degree in, right. in counselling. So uh, I uh, I went for an interview uh, for the job, and uh, I uh, eventually I, I got the job as the, the allows officer, and, and since then worked my way through the, the association up to where I'm now. So, so getting when, involved. Yeah, so when was that that you that you? That was um, uh, 2000. In 2000. So mm-hmm. so that was uh, and, and the, the need was there, but the energy was needed because. Uh, uh, I, I don't know about you folks, but, but I'm, I'm pretty convinced that he's energetic. I know him quite well. He's very energetic. But this, this thing of the, um, uh, it must be, it must have been your energy and, and your, your, your drive to do something that, that really pushed you forward. Yeah, I get, I mean, yeah, passion is something as a word we all like to use. And, and yeah. I, I've got a lot of passion. There's no two ways about that. Um, sometimes it turns into aggression. Um, I can be very aggressive. Um, yeah, but that's a personality thing, isn't it? Which, which, if it's consistent, um, I, people can yeah. deal with. I have to be I mean, careful I how I use it. Yeah, I, I have to be careful how I, how I do use it because I can get a bit vocal at times. I'm on, I don't threaten people or whatever, but uh, I, I can be a bit frightening when I get a bit passionate and vocal. But well, the good um, thing for my when I the, the things I've seen and I know about you doing it is you've really done it in really good time. You've done it with people that are really annoying, <laughs> particularly yeah. other organisations. So, yeah. so I'll, I'll give a little bit of a vote that, that maybe it was nicely controlled. Well, yeah, it it, it, it is. That's the passion. But uh, as I said, um, yeah, I think it, again, anger is good. I mean, uh, it's constructive anger, and I I able to focus my anger. But it's anger with the industry, as I said. I, I get very angry with the industry itself. Um, it's lack of movement, it's lack of expecting everybody else to do everything for it and then complaining when nothing gets done and yet you don't see anybody doing anything. Um, but when you do see people um, doing things, then everybody's very quick to criticise. Um, and there's very much, oh, you know, we don't like the way this is done, we don't like the way that's done. And then you say, well, why don't you get involved and help reshape it into how you believe it should be done? Oh, I'm too busy. Yeah, well, hold it, you know. Why don't you support the people out there doing it, even though it may not be in the way or the direction that you wish it, it to be, but at least it's constructive and it's moving forward and support them to do that as opposed to criticise them and say, you do it differently, um, if and the but. Um, which, which you know, I mean, what do we do with clients who sit there and if and the but? We, we sort of, you know, we sort of challenge them a little bit on that and yet councils are very quick to do it themselves, um, in, in my experience, particularly back in those days. I mean, not so much now. But, um, and, and so it was been able to harness that anger. And so now though, the, it's, it's got a lot more flow. Oh, look, yeah, yeah there's, there's, the, we're on a roll a bit. Look, the, um, you know, since I've been involved with ACA, I mean, just, just within itself, you know, we, we've got, um, a state association in each state. And the people who've been involved in, um, founding and, and uh, getting those associations rolling, and getting the membership, um, getting them to get out there and, and offer benefits and services to the members, uh, and to help to support ACA through profile and, and helping us in the state. I mean, that's a lot. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of people out there within ACA that have, that have really got off their, their rear ends for, for no, for no um, personal gain or financial no. gain um, and, and have helped us to develop associations and, and, and their policies. And all that. So there's a lot of people do a lot of work for nothing behind the scenes of ACA. I know New South Wales have really, we've just sort of finally got things sorted yeah. out. And there's, uh, you know, we've got a great team yeah. uh, oh. and they really enjoy doing the work. But I just, I just want to, uh, I mean, we, we, there's so much to talk about, so we'll, I'll just sort of direct things a little bit, because, um, terrific, you know, so Australia, now you're up, 2012, there's a lot of activity, the, the, there's a lot of activity going on local groups, so you don't necessarily do the state groups, it doesn't mm. work. So, um, so Philip, in uh, his very simple nature, says, well, I don't know, I think I might spread my boundaries a tad. Mm. And uh, uh, I was very excited about all this. That's one of the things I really want to hear a bit more about. And I know there's a, there's a lot more going, so you can only just give us a, a rough background. Mm. But you've actually now gone outside of Australia and you're talking to organisations around the world and there's something very interesting going on in uh, particularly the Commonwealth group of nations. But anyway, I think you know more than I mm. So perhaps if... Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, actually, it all stems back to 
in 2006 when um, ACA hosted the first international counselling conference in Australia and it was the, the IAC, the International Association of Counsellors, um, we held um, the conference um, on their behalf and there was the, um, the Australian Guidance and Counselling Association part of it with us and so it was a great international conference. Mm. And um, at, at the time, um, I just, you know, we met so many people internationally and, and I just realised that you know, um, we needed to start focusing outside Australia, not just within Australia. Because um, there's just so much great stuff going on, and so much networking and people. And one of the, I, I, I may not be popular this believe, but I'm, I'm a great believer. Australia is part of Asia. We're not part of Europe or America. Hmm. Um, I agree with you. And uh, and I think that um, it is one of the failings. A lot of things that we do in Australia is we don't recognise we're part of Asia, and Asia are our neighbours. Um, but um, the international association was great. It was great meeting all those people in those different countries. But it was very American centric, very Euro centric. Um, and um, and I thought, well, you know, what, why isn't there an Asian? Um, and there wasn't. I couldn't find one anyway. So um, I sat down with um, some people I'd met at that conference. Um, there was people from Hong Kong and and uh, all over the place. And um, I said, well, why don't we 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 put together an Asia Pacific um, association for councils for the Asia Pacific area, focusing on Australia, um, looking at China, looking at, at uh, India, and then looking Malaysia, at uh, Malaysia, Singapore. Singapore. Yeah, going all over. And so, uh, so we got together, and it was um, uh, Professor Catherine Sun from yes. from Hong Kong. Oh, well, of um, yeah, and uh, and so Catherine and I sat down, and and uh, and uh, with the support of uh, it was the Xi'an University that she works with. Um, they 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 have a lot of support with resources, and we founded the Asia Pacific uh, Confederation of Councils. And um, the primary focus of that is to is to is to to develop a, a venue or a platform from which councils from the region can get together and meet and discuss research, discuss um, what's happening in the area, but also give people the ability to be able to, to demonstrate um, the, whatever. That's right. And, and so we, we, we have, uh, so what we do is now we have biannual conferences and uh, so we, we, we start off with having our first conference, actually our first two conferences were both actually in Hong Kong. Um, and um, so, uh, and the next one is uh, next year in, uh, in August and that's in uh, Sarawak in Borneo. Um, so, so, so that has been really great, and uh, and, the, and the beauty about that is that we we're giving a venue, particularly for people from countries like um, Vietnam, um, Cambodia, Laos, um, Bangladesh, the countries that that are, are still developing and don't have a lot of money, is that we try to um, give them a, a venue which they can come to, make it very cost effective. Um, a lot of time, what we do is we get sponsorships uh, for them, so they get their accommodation and, and meals and all that for free, mm -hmm. um, and the the university usually helps us uh, with that. So. That gives them so they can come and actually meet with us and they can actually show us and talk to us, tell us what's happening in their countries and their neck of the woods. And and, and it was hugely important. I mean, I'm I'm a witness to the to the importance. I mean, this is the first one, uh, and and I was still sort of gaining a few legs. Mm -hmm. But as you know, I've been uh, going all around the world trying to yeah. place myself. And and this conference uh, last year in, in in Hong Kong, it was probably one of the most influential conferences I, I, I've been to. And I've 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 been into to Switzerland and in Holland and. And um, Sarajevo was actually a really important one as yeah. well. But I just sat there transfixed listening to uh, the, the wonderful uh, professor, uh, pardon me for getting, pardon me for getting your name, the, um, uh, from Japan talking about person-centered therapy saying, yeah. oh, but this is how we have to change it for the Japanese culture. And mm -hmm. listening to the wonderful speaker from India who was saying, oh, and you know Maslow's hierarchy of, uh, of, of needs, actually we have to change that for the Indian culture. Yeah. And the wonderful guys from uh, uh, from Taiwan, you know, just socialising with them is just a hoot. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Poe, who's hopefully going to come on and talk to us about some Buddhist psychology, yeah. and so with Jeffrey, I mean, like, I'm not talking to someone who, like we see so often in the West, where they got into it and they saw the value of Buddhist mm -hmm. psychology, which is terrific. Jeffrey's a Buddhist from birth; it's a part of his fibre, uh, and I'm really looking forward to that mm -hmm. interview. So actually, it was a big job you did. Yeah, well, well, Jeffrey actually uh, and I, um, I, I, I helped only a little bit. Jeffrey did all the work, but Jeffrey just founded a new professional counselling association yeah. in Singapore, which I think is so important. Yeah. So it's having these organisations around the world, but not disconnected, not mm. not um, uh, separated and and, yeah. uh, and uninfluential in the world. Yeah. I think this That's is what you're bringing. Which we had 17, 17 countries represented um, uh, with presentations. The, the yeah. last one. And Sarawak will be no, no less exciting. Yeah. 
Uh, oh, it's uh, look, Sarah, it's great, Ben. You've been over there, and uh, and uh, with the uh, particularly one of the focus we're doing is to bring a bit of wildlife or conservation into it, and that is the the um, trying to profile the um, the plight of the orangutan. Yeah, I, no, it's interesting. In my acting career, that was one of the things I did in the eighties. I went and did a lot of work with orangutans, uh, and then going on into studying human behaviour and then primate behaviour. Mm. Orangutans become one of my favourites. I mean, uh, Robert Sapolsky is a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of, and, and I, I was thinking about the uh, his, his stuff with baboons when you were talking about the the military, uh, but maybe. It's a bit better than that, but the 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 whole aspect. Uh, and no, I've got some good friends in America who are saying, well, "Tell us about this Asia Pacific thing." I want to come out. I want to see things. Uh, we, we actually did a talk um, where I summarised uh, a lot of the Asia Pacific mm. conference to the Gaines Group, the uh, Interpersonal Neurobiology Group in America. Yeah. And a great response. It was, it was, it was really good. Yeah, and so so that's that's sort of um, yeah that's something I'm really proud of is um, because you know we were told it wouldn't work. You know, they had all the knockers. Sure. But I mean, you know, here we're going into our fourth conference now, and primarily that's that's the the focus of the association now is is um, you know we we did start off with with different visions of where it would go, but this is where it's gone. This is where it's sort of been driven, and, and the, the demand is there um, to to be able to give uh, pretty much a venue for people within the Asia Pacific region to be able to demonstrate the the outcome of research and um, talk about workshops and, and what's happening. But it also the venue, as you said, it's such a great venue for people discussing how. What we do in the Western world doesn't work, um, you know, and I think you know, we doesn't need we need to be time. told that. Yeah. We don't, yeah. we, it doesn't work. We need to be told it doesn't work yeah. in, in those in cultures, places, in those environments. Yeah. Because particularly in a country like Australia, where I mean, you know, I've had clients who were Muslims who were Sikhs. You know, I've had Asian clients. I've had most of the world, and and you know, um, without being exposed to this sort of thing, I actually reflect actually on some of the clients I've had and how disrespectful I have been from two clients. Particularly in the early days, by not actually acknowledging and, and understanding and realising that these cultures—I mean, what I, what I was doing—I was doing what I was taught to do, but it, it was totally inappropriate. Um, and it's only been my exposure into the Asia Pacific um, and and talking to people working in the counselling and psychotherapy areas um, that say, "Oh, you know, <laughs> CBT might work here, but really, you know." Um, that, well, that's... Catherine said, put it beautifully, I think, uh, when she said, "Every client is their own culture." Yeah. And, and she talked about you know taking Western uh, uh, psychology back, and as a as an Asian yeah. woman, you know, nearly destroying two or three families in, a, in the process. So, but I, I just want to, because uh, unfortunately we've got to get a tick along yeah. because you know time ticks away. Uh, but because in amongst all this, the Asian conferences, you're still doing national conferences. I mean, it's not like you've left Australia; you're still here doing national conferences. Right. And we've had a number of those, and I've been uh, you know really, really, really uh, lucky. And, and privileged to speak at them myself, but we've also done uh, uh, along the way a couple of years back. There was uh, uh, an online conference. Now yeah. we're doing another one. Yeah, yeah. It was um, three years ago. We had a, a virtual conference, and the the there was two reasons we did that. One is because it hadn't been done before, as far as we were aware, and you know, always like to try new things. Um, and so, um, but also we um, we wanted to raise some money for kids' helpline, so we. We did a, uh, a virtual conference and we had people putting in donations and we raised $88,000. Wow. Kids Helpline, but it was through running a conference um, with people um, pre-recording pre their workshops and then putting them on the web and running it. Uh, I think it, was, uh, it ran for, um, for several days. Yeah. And we had uh, a lot of you know, some, some, some really great people um, doing workshops and having them filled off and I think. Uh, and uh, then we were able to, to put it on the web. And so that was really popular. So it raised um, eighty-eight thousand dollars in donations, and some people were donating twenty dollars at a time. Some would say, "You can figure it out for yourself." There's a lot of people watching that uh, that virtual conference. Well, I mean, it was great. I mean, I donated and I spoke. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm paying for myself with great pleasure. I mean, it really was a it really was a wonderful. Yeah. So um, what we're doing now is uh, we have another one in in June um, this year, and uh, I put my hand up again with hmm. pleasure. So well, we've actually asked you to open it. So yes, you have. Yeah. So I've the to uh, something good to say. <laughs> the uh, and and the the, the 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 two reasons that uh, we're doing that is um, is one that um, to help our members get their professional development because July is a renewal date so we uh, we're running again the conference um, and virtual so members can attend it and get their points up and and learn some great and we have some really great workshops that are, are being being done and that'll go for four days so that's a virtual conference so people won't miss anything so um, you know, if you can't see it on the on the Friday or the Monday you can see it on the weekend and it'll be running at night time and so. And we'll be replaying 
um, certain workshops so many times. So people will be able to see that, and, and that's all on a donation basis again. Um, people don't, uh, you know, they can decide how much they want to donate. And that donation uh, for that one is that uh, myself and the president, Simon Clark, the president of ACA, uh, we're raising money for cancer. And now, uh, let, let me just preempt, because, you know, you can imagine it's great. So what Philip does is he just goes out and gets all these other people to do all this work and then takes all this money and gives it to charity. No, no, no. I'm now, I'm now, now I'll take it back. So this actually, this conference, which is going to raise money, which is fantastic, this is coming as a second thought to something that you're doing for this charity. Yeah. Which uh, I know you asked me to come to do it, but I don't think my legs could manage. <laughs> Tell us what you're doing there. This is amazing. Well, we're, we're climbing uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. We're, we're going to Tanzania and uh, and uh, we're climbing the, uh, the the highest mountain in Africa, uh, which is a high altitude mountain. So actually, uh, since we we um, decided to do this, we just found out that actually this is reasonably dangerous and. Uh, and uh, yeah, people are high altitude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, Phil. <laughs> well, I, I now we're, we're in we're in pretty see, um, significant training right now because um, our fitness levels have to be quite quite high um, to to be able to do it because of the uh, the altitude that's involved. Um, so yeah, so so that's that's been a really good personal challenge and helped me to um, to to uh, to get myself fit again and been a good personal challenge there. But uh, also the um, you know, we're also taking the opportunity while we're over there is talking to. We're going to go to Kenya and uh, we're going to South Africa and we might be able to go to Uganda. Talking to um, the counselling uh, councillors and counselling associations in those individual countries to, to find out what is happening in Africa. Not not just, you know, we, we've looked at Asia, we're now looking at Africa and that's part of the, um, uh, what we're doing is we're looking at a, I'm the, the chair of the, um, the, um, the Counselling and Psychotherapy Association of Commonwealth Nations. Um, which is a, a new organisation which has been found, and we, we currently we have representatives from Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Malaysia, Canada, uh, UK, and New Zealand, and um, we're we're now looking for uh, obviously we need representation from the African from the African I mean, Commonwealth uh, countries because there's a lot going on in South Africa, and I'm, yeah. I'm hoping to actually we, there's definitely there's, there's two or three people from South Africa who who I'm talking to to get onto Mind Science TV, which will be which will be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, hopefully there are you know a bunch of you out there. This is a this is a great uh, introduction to, to call us, call us, us mate, so we can come and visit. Yeah, so. yeah. And and if anybody's listening and they want to they want to make some kind of connection to Philip, uh, then please do. You can always contact me and I'll pass it on. Mm. But uh, you know, the ACA. Dot net. Dot au. Um. But yeah, yeah. It's www. Dot ACA. Dot ASN. Dot au. All right. Fantastic, but we'll have that. I'll put that on the on the website, the, the, the links. Uh, so what we've, I mean, what an, int I mean, he's just such an interesting fellow. You, you've been in the military. You've gone through um, significant personal trauma. You've actually been the hand holder of a lot of other people. This has led you on to you know expand and develop you, you know, the, the military. Perhaps not out of intention, but just out of misguidance, ends up leaving you in a bit of a hole. Uh, you put yourself out through study and through work. You apply. You suddenly find you can do things. You're building organisations. Now you're doing international stuff. You're climbing up goddamn mountains. I haven't even mentioned, and we'll just briefly, I just want to bring up the fact that you've also um, applied yourself to ongoing training through textbooks. And you've actually written several uh, and been part of the editing panels of several textbooks, which are just uh, just fundamental ones. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was really, I was really fortunate. Um, that um, Dr. Nadine Pelling, who's a, uh, a clinical psychologist in, in South Australia, um, uh, approached me with um, Dr. Randolph Bowers, who was a, a senior lecturer at the University of New England, um, and we we collaborated to put together a book on on counselling, and uh, we felt that there needed to be an Australian tech um, on counselling, but uh, one that was a little bit more broad and diverse. There are, there are a few, but they're written by individuals, and it's about their modalities and how they, they perceive it. Um, and so we wanted to bring together a, 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 a combination of a heap of Australian um, academics, um, lecturers, people who had been involved in counselling to, to write a book on counselling in, in Australia. And so it's called The Practice of Counselling and it's now used by a lot of the universities as a textbook. But it has quite a lot of um, uh, Australian, but actually we, we've also got some Canadian and, and uh, British um, therapists who were, were wrote, wrote some of the chapters. So it was um, was co-edited by myself and um, Nadine and Randolph, and then uh, what came from that was um, when we were looking at professional supervision, we were very again we were um, surprised, I suppose, um, 
the, the, the lack of texts in Australia written for Australians. And, and it is my passion, you know. Now, Australian texts for Australian people. Um, and, uh, and they need to be multicultural because we are a multicultural nation. And uh, so it needs to be written in many different ways. And so it was written out. The same thing happened with supervision. I, I, I looked around and there was nothing. And again... Someone's filling a hole. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was... Yeah. Um, yeah. Dr. Uh, Dr. John Barletta, who was uh, then a, uh, a senior lecturer at the um, uh, Catholic University yeah, in well Brisbane, yeah. yep. and um, again uh, Nadine, Dr. Nadine Pelling, yeah. uh, came on board, and um, we got uh, that was posted by the Australian Academic Press. The, the practice of counselling was by Cengage, and so we we put that together, and again we did the same process. We 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 went out there and we found a whole heap of um, supervisors. Um, and the different modalities, we had uh, supervision from nursing, from social work, from counselling, from psychology, mental health, um, and put all the different models together and got all different authors. And uh, we uh, we were very privileged that Dr. Carroll from the UK, mm. um, yes. he wrote the foreword, uh, and he's you know, one of the leading experts in, in supervision. Um, so he wrote the foreword for the for the text. And so, um, yeah, so that text is out there. So, yeah, I'm so very fortunate. And I think importantly, uh, this, these texts are finding some resonance in Malaysia and in, in the Asian, uh, this, this close Asia region. So this Australia yeah. is not a separate entity. It is a part of Asia. I think that that, that tells us that. Well, yeah, well, I'm, I think the, the uh, one of them um, is very heavily used at uh, University of Fiji. Um, so, so, so yes, yeah, so thank you. Anybody from Fiji buying the book. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so they've been very popular outside of Australia. And actually, there was a lot of resonance in, uh, in, in Canada too. In Canada. Um, because the, the Canadians like looking for texts that aren't, uh, aren't necessarily American, because obviously they get a lot of American texts. So. But, there, but there's also quite an affinity between Can yeah. Canadians and Australians. Oh, look, we, we, there's uh, a lot of personality similar. Well, ACA itself, you know, I, I have a very, very, um, close relationship with, um, the, uh, the Canadian Association and, and the, the president, um, of the, uh, the Canadian Association. A, a wonderful person. Yeah. So, uh, so as part of that's what we do with ACA, and we're very much about reaching out, and we have a, a um, uh, an affiliation with the Canadian Counseling Canadian uh, Counseling and Psychotherapy Association. We've also done we have a, a really close relationship with the New Zealand Association, um, with um, the the Asia um, Professional Counseling Association of Asia, which is based in Hong Kong. But we're also, I mean, ACA we're the only, uh, and we're very privileged to be the uh, only. Um, organisational honorary member to the British Association of Council yeah. Psychotherapy. So we have affiliations there too. So yeah, we certainly like um, going out there and, and meeting our, our, our brothers and sisters from the industry in, in all these different countries to learn what's happening. And their arms are open to everybody. I mean, the, the, the Canadian Counseling Association, I, I, I did a, a webinar uh, yeah. for them. I just sort of said, I'd like to do that. And they said, oh, yeah, we saw you looking lovely. And they've come back and I'm now doing uh, uh, three, uh, three months of, of presenting yeah. stuff. And they, they ask. You know, so these associations that the ACA is making internationally, it's not just at the administrative level, it's oh, at the no. practitioner level. Oh, look, it, uh, it's partners, partnering in with uh, conferences and, and inviting each other over. I'm over I've got, uh, been invited over with uh, Simon, our president, to Canada next year to cool. attend their conference and yeah. the further discussions well, on the Commonwealth Association. Year, which is great. You know, yeah, and, uh, they're very open and very welcoming. Mm -hmm. Look, okay, it's um, it's just fantastic, but I think um, again we underestimate ourselves in Australia. We we tend to be the hub, actually, um, uh, when I'm it comes to uh, to to these sort of things. We're, we're very well situated because of our position within Asia, and sort of you know we've got Europe's over there and the States are over there. We we're, we are very central, and sort of Asia is just up the top there. So we are in a very very good position, and, and it's easy for people to, to sort of come over here because it's sort of halfway to everywhere. So it's a lot easier to get here than, than to you know, fly, fly across a lot of places. But also, um, uh, you know, we, we have a very multicultural industry. Mm. Um, you know, we, we've, uh, I've been involved, well, I know, I know people down, uh, and members down in Victoria, and we have the Muslim uh, council, we have Afghan councillors, mm. we have Korean councillors, people who practice in Korean, and, and so on and so on. So it's, it's very diverse. Yeah, it's very I've multicultural. Like that in, in Sydney, Japanese, uh, Afghani, I mean, yeah. really, really interesting. Mm. Now we're probably time is ticking away, mm. and it's. I think now though is really good. That's such a rounded picture. I guess the last, the last sort of question really is: there a vision? What, where, where next? I mean, you're doing so much, but you're the sort of guy that that, that always is pushing the boundary. Do you have a sense yeah, where, of where it's, you're going? I, well, there's two areas. Um, there's the the government, and then there's commercial. Um, with the government, it, it's 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 very important, and and we are making headway. Um, I, I believe we'll get there one day, um, and in the near future, not, not twenty years down the track, in my lifetime. 
um, acceptance by the government as far as coming under the, the medical the national mental health scheme here in Australia, Medicare, um, where, where councils will be able to practice with um, rebates un, under the, the, the health system. Um, we are getting there. We're certainly getting heard. Um, so my, my, that's one of my visions is, is I, I really don't want to stand down from my, from my position within ACA until I've achieved that. Um, so that's very important to me um, and, and to the industry as a whole. And yeah, if we can achieve that, we'll be the first country in the world to, to achieve it. Um, but um, I mean, they said we couldn't get private health funds, and we did. We did that back in 2002. Was the first time we got it. Everyone said we couldn't be done. So you know, you've got to motivate me. Tell me I can't do it. Yes. Right. <laughs> but the, the the second one is is one that again I'm I'm still feeling a bit of frustration within the industry and, and myself is the lack of um, the lack of impact we have on the commercial sector, particularly those in private practice. Um, without relying on the health system, um, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of health people who who work outside of the the health system, and I think uh, we should be doing that as councils too. And that's developing programs that are in demand by the communities, but also um, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of services out there that are delivered by non mental health professionals that I really believe um, mental health professionals need to be delivering, and which is why um, there, there is not a lot of success. And, and you know, I look at obesity as one. Uh, and that's, that's a major problem in, in, in Australia and all over the world. And uh, what we have is we have commercial organisations selling meal replacement, selling frozen food and all this sort of stuff. And we know that that doesn't resolve obesity. It, it makes a lot of people money. Um, and I've even gone to the supermarket and, and seen some of these and, and actually look at the labels and you actually read the labels and you read some of the, the, the home brand and the home brand stuff's actually healthier yeah. than this stuff that they double in the price for in yeah. this country. But, but we know that obesity is a mental health problem. Um, it's it's a, you know, emotional triggers. It, it's it's we need to resolve why people eat. I mean, obesity is easy. It's caused by overeating. We know the cause. That's easy. Meal replacements and selling overpriced canned food with a label on it is it, not going to resolve that. Um, it's, it's a mental health issue, and so we need to get out there commercially and get involved in resolving these issues as councils working as mental health professionals instead of watching people making bucket loads of money, knowing that no one's getting cured or going anywhere. Um, it's just they got all this money to get celebrities to go on TV and say, hey, look at me, I've lost all this weight. What we don't see is a celebrity five years down the track put it all back on again. Um, or or it's a lot easier when you've got so much so much sort of around you to, to, to help. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, we even know that the, the people who lose weight um, on, 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 on programs like um, you know, Biggest Loser, we don't want you to take them out of that controlled environment. But it all goes back on again because we haven't dealt with the mental health. So that, that's, that's my big vision as far as the, the commercial aspect, I think. The industry really needs to get out there and be more competitive and more aggressive commercially in delivering programs um, that that um, are, that have been delivered by non non professionals, and we need to get them by the short and curly and say, hey, look, you know, the reason why we're still suffering from this 20, 30 years down the track is because it, it is being delivered by people interested in making money as opposed to people who are interested in actually resolving the issue, you know, truly, sincerely wanting to, to resolve the issue. And of course, yeah, we have to make a living in the in the, in the process, but. Our, our, um, our focus is in curing, um, and um, and then hopefully getting into early intervention and prevention. Um, but we've got to get out there, and we've got to be involved in the whole process, and we need to be doing it from a commercial perspective as well as looking at the the government health system, putting our capacity to do the work up front, That's right? Not waiting for somebody to say, "Would you mind doing this?" Well, it's a significant workforce we've got um, out there. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's councillors, and then geographically, there's no restriction, and a lot of them seem to want to do more. Yes, so they certainly do. <laughs> Well, maybe on that note, that 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 counselling is not just uh, a subsidised help thing, or that that's a part of it. It's a profession, Certainly and it's a profession is. that can deal with so many issues, uh, uh, because so many issues that are going on are to do with our health, of which Definitely. what's going on in our head is actually a part of it. Yeah, I mean, obesity. We have suicide, um, you know, which you're heavily involved in. in um, that, all these issues, and and um, you know, um, councils should be out there uh, at the front line working on these issues, and uh, they all overlap. I mean, there's, there's, even with uh, obesity, we know there's no, we know overeating is the cause, but the mental yeah. reasons, the, the reason why people do it, is, is um, you know, a lot of overlapping issues that come with that. And so we need to be out there helping resolve these issues, giving some real answers mm -hmm. as opposed to just making money. We we've actually got an exciting future, and that's that's something that I hope this talk has uh, has brought up because that's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling uh, like from someone who's a practitioner, but is an administrator, that that we're this isn't a talk we're saying oh well yeah, it's pretty difficult. 
it's sort of like, no, it's great. There's this, there's that, there's the borders, there's outside, there's, there's all these things. Um, I don't know about you guys, but that was pretty inspiring. Uh, uh, as I say almost at the end of every mind science thing, I have to go away and think about this for a while. Maybe you should do the same. Anyway, thanks for joining us. And thank you for, for giving your time. It's so much appreciated. Thank you for inviting me to spit out and giving me the opportunity to have my say. You did indeed, and I loved it. Bye-bye, everyone.